Good day, everyone, and welcome to Seamless Southern Africa. I am Sudeshni, your track host for financial inclusion and fintech. I'd like to welcome you to our first session for today, Collaboration, the key to preventing industry-wide digital crisis. Please let me uh, introduce you to our host for today, Martin Grunewald. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you in this virtual context. I think I've run a few panels before in, in the past, but I don't think I've ever run one in virtually. So um, I hope you'll just join us with, with an interesting experience. Um, we, we've got a double whammy today. <laughs> not, not only are we virtual, but we load shedding. So I know a couple of our panelists are having some challenges around um, the, the whole connectivity during load shedding. So if you see Sean Maton from APSA there, he hasn't just frozen out of shock being on the panel. He's actually um, having some connectivity issues today. So he, we'll be able to hear him, but not necessarily see him. Um, before I let the panel um, introduce themselves and, and get you acquainted, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit around what we'll cover today. Um, as, as I met with this panel and we chatted, I became really excited about the, the group of people we've got in here for the subject today. Um, everyone's been doing a lot of work around this um, over the last few years in very different ways. And I think, you, uh, I hope that this is gonna be a really enriching experience for you and that you'll learn something today, but also go away and start those conversations around how we collaborate through um, this period of trying to sort out what we do around digital identity. Um, in the last few years, I've seen so many startup companies, so many initiatives around identity, a lot of it initially being driven out of the need for KYC and, and FICA requirements, but it's expanded and there's a whole lot of social needs that have happened over the last while. And, and obviously the, the, the COVID um, crisis has let us even have deeper insight as to why we need this. And eventually it all leads into this picture of a sovereign digital identity. So we'll be exploring those things. And I think the need for us all to come together around the subject, I think becomes more and more important. I don't think one entity can ever solve for this anymore. I think because we way past that. So without, um, prolonging this, or I don't think you guys have joined yet a year for me today. Um, I'm going to start with Barry. Um, Barry, if you could just introduce yourself and, and give us a little bit of background of what you've been doing around this. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, no, my name is Barry Cooper. I'm a technical director at Century, which is the Center for Financial Regulation and Inclusion. We are a think and do tank. We do a lot of research and technical assistance across the developing world. And in, in this space, I, I'm, I'm responsible for looking after the uh, payments and financial in, uh, in integrity, which is AML, CFT, illicit flows uh, and identity. And these, in this space, the, those topics are, are converging. Um, and we've been working across um, Sub-Saharan Africa and also with AFI, we've been working on a, a toolkit for uh, inclusive integrity uh, across across the world, and um, this this topic is just is just opening up all over the show, sub-Saharan Africa, and now even the uh, Pacific Islands are, are on it. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very fast moving, and in COVID, it's moving even even faster. Thanks, Barry. Um, Kathy, would you give us a little bit about you? I work as the technical advisor at the Government Technical Advisory Centre on an EU-funded program that's got a very dodgy acronym. It's called the CBPEP, Capacity Building Program for Employment Promotion. Um, more recently, I've been working specifically with the President's uh, Project Management Office uh, regarding the design of a SASA grant, a special COVID grant, which I'm sure you've all seen in the paper. We're also now trying to see how we're going to promote payments uh, through the Employment Stimulus Package as well for um, various government departments. 
I started um, sort of similar to Barry as well, started working uh, on um, at the financial intelligence sector actually in 2011, specifically looking at KYC and all the AML stuff and used to chair the rented departmental working group on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Um, and in 2016 and 17, I actually worked on modernizing the Department of Home Affairs as a department. And there we looked at digital identification specifically and how we move um, identity out of administration and into the security cluster as well, mm -hmm. so that we can look at secure identification for the country as a backbone for e-government services. Awesome. Thanks, Cathy. Sean, do you want to kick us off? Hi, Sean Maton from APSA Bank. I work within the CTO office. Um, and whew, over the last three years, we've been playing quite a bit in the digital identity space. Uh, we've, as APSA, have become a sovereign steward. Um, and better much of the last, towards November, 18 months prior to that, we were working on a pilot um, uh, within the uh, blockchain consortium, which we completed. Um, to uh, It was around the proof points of digital identity and our first use case related to, of course, being in financial institutions was KYC and how you could, um, without interacting directly be able to um, register a certified digital identity and then of course open a bank account uh, the beginning of this year uh, we started a pilot um, which included standard bank and bank serve on proving the interoperability between solutions or different solutions um, back to martin's point it's a broad audience so everybody can't be using the same thing um, that interoperability was proved in the second, third week of July. Um, and that's where we are. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Kajiso, over to you, if you could just give us an intro of yourself. Um, thanks, Martin. So I'm Kajiso, uh, Department Head of the FinTech Unit at um, the FSCA. And so our focus area, so we co-lead um, the innovation hardware vehicle that we've recently launched for the financial services sector. And this is really a space for us to test innovations and also to accelerate policy around fintech innovation. So that's the focus of our responsibility. Prior to that, I was at several organizations, one of them being Vodacom, where um, I was responsible for crafting their financial services strategy, which has um, since evolved um, quite significantly. So that's some of the stuff that I've done in the past. And also before that, I was in consulting where I um, um, built strategies for financial services provider across the continent and globally. And specifically in terms of this topic, for us as a FinTech unit, this is definitely a, a topic of interest for us because of the attractive benefits around financial inclusion. But obviously there's risks as well that we need to be cognizant of. So those are some of the things we also want to balance um, some of the benefits versus the risks. So we look forward to this discussion where we get to unpack this topic a little bit more. Awesome. Thanks, Kukhisa. Um, Kathy, maybe we can kick off with you a little bit around the need. I think um, this period of COVID is, is really sharp and maybe our thinking around some stuff, nothing like a good crisis. And, and, and I think you've been on the receiving end of some of that. Um, and maybe you can just talk around what was kind of the things that you saw coming uh, from a need perspective and, and why this has become so important. Thanks, uh, we just, thanks, Martin. I thought I was on mute. Okay. Um, so when the crisis hit, uh, we soon realized that food poverty was going to be a big issue in South Africa, particularly in the townships. And so we designed a special grant, uh, a COVID grant under the presidency, which we then pushed forward and, and got SASA to actually roll it out. And the grant was actually designed um, at speed, it needed to target between eight and 15 million people. We knew that the target audience was roughly about 15 million people, but uh, we only had sort of budget for about eight. 
and we would need to do some back-end testing around it before we would onboard people and then there were challenges around how to find people where they were located how to onboard them how to verify and authenticate them so we came up with what we thought were pretty slick solutions we thought in a digital age that we are in given that we have a unique identity system in south africa we could use the home affairs database as a backbone stitch together all the relevant databases SARS stepped in to do all the back end cleaning up of the of the system and we could pre-identify people so we could almost like push a service through to sasa so when beneficiaries on boarded we could quickly approve and vet them um, and we thought this is cool. We've got a you know very sophisticated banking sector, and on paper it all looked very pretty, or so you'd think. It was a, a very workable solution. And then the real world hit, and we realised that actually the the because we don't have a unique digital identification system, uh, our data sets are very outdated. They're not um, current as well. We actually didn't know where beneficiaries were, how we would find them. Um, you know, where to locate them, how to authenticate them, etc. Um, and I think for me, the, the, the need isn't just SASA, right? Home, um, you know, with the UIF, they've got similar issues around identification, making sure that they're actually paying the right person. There's a lot of fraud in the system, um, which I think they're not sure if they're paying the right person at the right time. Government, because it's not really geared to pay in a digital age, has got very weak payment systems. So as a result, they're open to a lot of fraud and corruption in that, which I think they're not really geared to handle. So I think for me, the biggest takeaway and um, is that you do need a unique identity system. We have a backbone in place through Home Affairs, but if you have a digital identity system that can remotely onboard people, verify and authenticate them, it becomes very easy to do government to person payment systems in place where you can actually offer government services, where you know exactly who the beneficiary is, where they are located, what they're eligible for, what they're entitled to, and you can actually push payments to them. In doing that, you can really clean up the system, root out all the corruption, it becomes auditable, it becomes traceable, you know exactly who you're paying, etc. And at the moment, I've been tasked by the presidency's PMO to actually look at an interoperable payment system, particularly as a test case for the um, employment stimulus package. The Jobs Fund is going to be looking at rolling out um, jobs to about 200,000 people. But if we can actually centralize um, the payments into the national payment system, managing payments on a back end, underpinned by a unique identity, which is the key sort of digital identity actually, where you can biometrically verify people, whether it's retina or facial recognition, et cetera, it doesn't really matter. You can then link them to either a bank account or a mobile phone. Uh, then you can actually pay them. You facilitate government payment services in a much smarter way, more efficient and you root out corruption. So we're looking at trying to develop some of those initiatives. So the need is growing. Um, but, you know, to try and centralize it is not ideal. What we're trying to do is sort of department by department to try and, and, and sort of engender this kind of culture in the public sector. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Barry, if, if you look at, um, you guys have done quite a lot uh, of work around financial inclusion and, and around the region as well. And you've probably seen a number of, of these solutions emerging. What are you seeing as the trends um, in our region and maybe what, what can we learn from this? Yeah, um, Martin, so the, the, the issue in, in the region is, is that, um, you know, the, the context matters and context within a country matters and context within a region matters. And it matters so much that I, I get Kathy's point that um, things work on paper, but we don't live in a paper world. We actually live in a physical world. And um, that, that, that context is, is so important to understand the infrastructure layering on there, the governance, uh, governance issues, risks. Uh, which are which are nuanced for for every for every single jurisdiction. What we see coming out of it is that obviously mo mobile is the is the the most important proxy identifier or, or utilization of of uh, of an identifier. Um, uh, and we're seeing that you know, in m mobile is typically used on USSD, which is probably not that secure. Mobile money is it has it is has become a um, 
a, a very, well, it's the dominant uh, payment system in terms of numbers of transactions in sub-Saharan Africa and, and elsewhere. Um, but it, it's not progressing and it's inefficient and uh, it, it's fragmented and siloed. And it, uh, a lot of these issues uh, revolve around um, interoperable identities. We've seen a lot of moves in, in Nigeria to put an interoperable, the BVN and a couple of others. Um, but as long as these solutions are not coordinated, um, they don't seem to gel that well. We've seen in, in Uganda, they've put in a superb um, uh, biometric um, uh, system, but we call it a monument to biometrics because it, it's, it's, just, it's just a single tower of biometrics, but it has no use cases. It doesn't have a business case. You know, longevity is not there. It's, it's this integrated approach. You have to build it up from the bottom um, to instill trust uh, in the system, trust from within and from uh, and by the consumer in, in the system. And that's very, very difficult to, 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 uh, to achieve. We've seen some examples in, in Australia, the Reserve Bank with PayID, um, of how, how coordinated approaches can, can really instill trust and, and uh, some of the lessons that they learned in, in sequencing and, and putting these coordination, coordinated approaches together. Definitely, I think the time has gone where identity becomes a competitive space. Um, yeah. And it becomes, it's, it's a cooperative space. It's a space that al allows economies to grow and for people to be uh, brought into that econ those, those economies and engaged with, with econ economic in inclusive activities through the means of a financial system. And this, I think, is the, is the cutting edge. And this is where a lot of things are pointing to. Um, in terms of the AML side of things, we, we're jettisoning the old version of or the old notion of KYC in, in favor of identity proofing. So that's, yeah. that just shows you that identity and financial services have, have converged. They, they, are, they are the same thing, but it's not, it should not only be limited to financial services because those use cases um, are pervasive across the economy. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. Tachisha, I'd like to bring you in at this point around um, what have you seen around the developing countries um, and, and how could we actually coordinate this better? How can we learn from other examples? Um, I don't know what you think of what has happened in India as an example. Um, why don't you give us your view on how we start coordinating this better? Yeah, sure. So in terms of our learnings from developing countries versus developed countries, I mean, um, we've seen some examples across both sets, but um, there's a few differences and nuances that we probably have to account for. So for instance, some of the success stories that we've seen in the developed world are Bank ID in Sweden, for instance. So that was quite successful. In Estonia as well, that was, they, have, they also have a successful example. And then you've got Secure Key Concierge in Canada, for instance. And all those had a, adoption rates of about 50% and above. Right, so that's in the developed world. So if you then look at um, the developing world, that's where um, there's been mixed stories. So ADA in India, that's definitely a success story um, in terms of, um, because its adoption rates are around 90%. So they really were able to successfully roll it out and it's often used as an example. But if you look at other countries, so for instance, national EID in Nigeria, that was another um, initiative that was essentially looking to um, to drive digital ID. So they only have an adoption rate of about 10%. And then also if you look at Argentina as well, I mean, um, another developing emerging market um, with their SID system, they also had adoption rates of about 10%. So mixed bag of um, success stories when you look at um, the emerging market. So for us, um, and Barry alluded to this quite nicely around the fact that each context, each, each domestic context um, has to be accounted for. And you have to look at what are some of the barriers that are ultimately um, disabling or, or preventing for the, for the scaling of digital ID. And so for us, um, when we look at it from a South African perspective, that's also essentially um, the thinking. We have to take a nuanced look at what is our social context? What are some of the the key enablers and obviously that's an ecosystem perspective so you have to look at it from a mobile mobile penetration you have to look at it from a data penetration perspective and even when you look at mobile usage obviously as Barry touched on um, you have to look at USSD usage versus smartphone usage and um, among other aspects and then also if you look at the, the pieces around financial inclusion as well 
right from access to usage to quality. So all those dimensions that underlie financial inclusion, how, how could those also be solved for through digital ID? So those are some of the perspectives that we, we are taking. We're looking, looking at it from an ecosystem perspective, taking into account our local context in order to, I mean, the aspiration is to find, to be also a success story, just like India, where they've obviously got 90% adoption. But we do recognize that there's variance, particularly in the emerging markets around success. Um, so um, we do have to account for our own context in order to successfully scale. Yeah, thanks, Kofisu. Um, Sean, and you've been involved in quite a lot of different projects on this, both in South Africa and across the region. And I know APSA are, 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 have been doing stuff in their own rights around this. Um, what have your learnings been along the way and how, how do you see this progressing from a real practical implementation perspective? Uh, so, so Martin, yes, we've, uh, from an APSA perspective, have been doing quite a bit of work in this uh, area. And um, from a, let's call it to me, there's two parts. One being we in the beginning kind of realized if we don't have a type of show and tell, uh, the yeah. concept becomes difficult to grasp uh, for the bigger community. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we did the original pilot and completed that last year so that we kind of got something to show and tell. We do have a video, it's on YouTube somewhere under BankSurf somewhere and people can go view it to actually see the concept in a live type of environment. Uh, learnings is three things. One being you need a golden source of information um, because if you don't have that you don't have trust um, and what you need to realize is that from a self-sovereign perspective the framework in itself and I'm not referring to the technology has different levels of um, governance related to uh, components within identity so you kind of can have a self-attested you can then move up to kind of third-party attestments and then uh, have the attestments done at a golden source type of environment and that kind of takes you through different levels of trust and when you get to the the top golden source level that level of trust then is the top level uh, you kind of can't get more than that so, and it's for people to realize that you don't kind of need to jump from a zero to hundred in day one. You can actually gradually in certain markets actually move up the scale. Um, and, the, and that's the part of getting the message through to the different environments. You don't necessarily need government to implement it um, because they are that source. Uh, to me, private sector slash financial, if you look at the example in Europe, it was bank ID. So the banking fraternity started it. Canada, the banking fraternity started. But it grew as people started seeing the trust in the ecosystem and that type of stuff. So you, you need to start somewhere. Um, it is not going to be uh, a thing that is going to be accepted uh, on day one. I must admit with COVID, we might see a different picture and get people accepting yeah. it a lot sooner than what we thought, um, which, yeah. which I think where we are is to our advantage. If you take the other uh, implementations, they kind of started when there wasn't this type of crisis. So people weren't in that movie of digitization and that type of stuff where COVID has brought that on a lot faster. Um, more from a technical perspective, standards. Standards, standards, standards. Talking to Barry's point of interoperability, if you do not have those standards in place, we're all just going to be islands. And in this domain, you can't be an island because an individual would then have 47 of these things on his mobile device, depending on who he's talking to, uh, which doesn't give you that scale in from an economical perspective. And then 
um, is, uh, uh, and it's giving that first footing by the door. So whoever gets that first use case out there, it is just going to grow. It is bigger than one given institution, like Martin, like you said. If we don't have the full ecosystem buying into it, then it's kind of just going to be another, uh, Barry mentioned it, tower of information that kind of just wastes our time. Yeah, agreed. Mm. Thanks, Sean. Um, if I can just remind the audience, we'll, we'll also take questions from you guys. So please um, submit your questions as we go through and we'll leave enough time for any Q&A at the end. Um, I think that's given us a, a good background and a good starting point. What I'd like to do is with all the panelists is just unpack a little bit. So if we go back to the drawing board in South Africa and say, what, what do we have where are we now? Where do we go to? I think um, Sean raised a really good point around creating standards, but at a point there needs to be that collaboration and that coming together around what those standards are and, and, and how we do it. So Barry, maybe I could kick off with you and I'll, I'll go through the whole panel on this question, but, but where are we now? And, and where do we go to from here? Well, to just in, in terms in terms of standards, there there are there are a, a lot of standards. But what we're seeing is that um, you know the, the different different channels, different instruments are applicable to, to you know to different contexts, and it's it's becoming more important to have a a a stack of of different modalities of, of interacting, so that you can reach the the, the broadest number of people with the best um, scale. Um, in order to, to, to deepen, deepen financial services, formal financial services. Um, you know, informal financial services don't really have these con uh, constraints. Um, but at the moment, I think the, the formal side is, is really, really um, on, on the up and up. Because, and that gives us an opportunity to push in standards such as you know, mobile numbers, uh, QR codes, you know, a, a lot of things that, that, that are accessible, verifiable, um, have a, a level of security in them, or trustworthy, um, uh, have, have a, a definitely a, a uniqueness factor to them. Um, and what we're seeing is that not, not one thing um, is, is good enough for uh, just one nation. And, and if you're looking at yeah. regional interoperability, you're going to have to look at a, a whole, a whole, um, a whole, a whole uh, deck of, of, of different things. And it's not impossible yeah. to be interoperable with, in, on different standards, provided they're not proprietary, uh, proprietary standards. So as long as it's an ISO yeah. or related standard and that it's appropriate for what's going to be utilized, um, there shouldn't be that, 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 that issue. issue. Um, and, and in terms of guidance on standards, you, we've definitely got the ITU. Um, I sit on the ITU with, uh, with, on CBDC and, and uh, the ISO. Um, but th those are some of the standards are not always applicable to the developing world, but that's that's the, the first the first level of guidance. If it's not if it's proprietary, then then you've you've got a problem. You've got problems with vendor locking. You've got problems with siloing. That that's that's problematic. Yeah, agreed. Kathy, if if you can um, handle the same question. Sure, so I'm just going to look at it more in terms of where we're at and in terms of identity. Um, so, I mean, we've got a, a pretty sophisticated, unique ID system, um, but I do agree with Sean. Um, I, I think progressively, because of the pressure that's being placed on the financial services sector to do KYC and move into the eKYC space um, and do digital proofing and verification, I think, and given that we've also got, you know, added to that the beneficial ownership stuff that is being put onto banks to make sure that they can identify the unique beneficial owner to make sure that there's not, you know, money laundering and terror financing. I, I agree that we're moving into a space where you might have a state providing a unique identity, but the actual implementation of digital identity and security, verification and proofing in order to, um, promote an interoperable payment system, monetize, like, you know, cash economies, um, you know, 
promote financial inclusion, et cetera, I think that sort of role is going to lie predominantly in the financial services sector that are going to lead that charge and predominantly lead the space into sovereign self-identification, which you are then responsible for deciding who has access to your information. Obviously, standards are important and you don't want to have 40 apps that are doing the same thing. So that level of interoperability starts to become important. For me, I think it's the key and the key lever for e-government service. So if you look, for example, New Zealand has a real me platform, you actually verify yourself, you, um, you know, through this type of secure platform, I'm sure it's sort of blockchain based anyway, but you can, and it's also layered as Sean had indicated. So you can do sort of lower levels of, you know, verification and proofing, but the more sophisticated it is, the more services you can access in the public service. And it'll almost give you a menu of what services you can have access to. The nice thing about that is you don't even need to go and vote and stand in a queue. You can actually vote in your pajamas at home. So, I mean, I think the power of digital identification and moving into self-sovereign identification really is where we're heading. And I think the charge will be led by the financial services sector, but obviously being guided by, so South Africa has that unique identity. We don't need an ADAR. We have a unique ID system that the banks are constantly pinging to check. So I think that's fundamentally where we're going. Um, yeah. Thanks, Cathy. Kajisa, yeah, would you sure, like sir. to add to this? Yeah, sure. So directionally from our perspective as regulators, um, so there's several things that we're doing um, to ultimately arrive at a position and a way to um, guide and enable the sector. So number one, we've been driving, we've been having discussions already within the entire ecosystem just around surfacing what are the actual benefits and risks that need to be accounted for, how nascent or advanced are we as a country, what are the unique things that we, we need to take into account um, around our social context, right? So we've had dialogues through our IFWG forums and um, there was consensus that this, is a, this is, would be something that is very beneficial as Cathy alluded to. And um, it's almost, it's a disruptive and inevitable trend that we're heading on. So yeah. then it's more a question of how, right? So that's then where through our innovation hub, we are now, um, opening up to fintechs essentially to come and, and financial services providers um, across the entire ecosystem to try to bring solutions that they'd like to test so that we can actually take a closer look at how these solutions work and um, what is the potential benefits and risks that um, are, are inherent in the solution. And this is to essentially identify firstly how to amplify those benefits and secondly mitigate those risks in order to enable um, such solutions you know, to go into the market, right? Because of the compelling benefits that we identify around, um, around our digital ID. Um, so that, that's one of the other things. And that also allows us to have a fact base that we can then use to ultimately um, develop enabling um, regulations. So that's essentially been our approach in recognition of this trend. So on one hand, driving forth leadership, on the other hand, actually creating a platform to test so that we can make fact-based decisions around um, how to approach um, this particular space going forward. So th that's been our approach. And so we, we envision that through that proactive and collaborative approach, um, it will certainly lead to um, to innovations that um, do come out, but also regulation that's enabling. Thanks, Kukhisa. Sean, how do you see this journey to date and, and the way forward? Um, so I, I'm very glad to hear uh, that Kukhisa has um, put out the invite from an innovation perspective. Um, so I'll be knocking on his door tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> um, no, so, uh, so I mean, what we've done over the last uh, couple of months um, because of uh, COVID and that, uh, the World Economic Forum um, has also uh, kind of got involved in digital identity uh, and not just from a South African perspective, they've got, they created a digital identity coalition network across Africa. Um, and we've already had a couple of sessions about three, four weeks ago, we had a three, four hour type of workshop. Uh, we had the likes of Smart Africa there. We had um, 
United Nations, ID for Africa. And out of that uh, four hour workshop, we came up with a list, I think it was around 15 call to actions um, that we would like to, from an African perspective, uh, put in play, um, especially around uh, digital identity. The two biggest themes that came out was a governance model um, that we need to uh, put in play. So something that governs the environment, that sets the trust levels. Um, to, going back to the example I used of you've got the entry level self-attestation. If you want to have full trust, it has to be golden source and actually start listing the actual golden sources so that people actually start realizing when you actually get to this piece that the, the trust level is correct. Um, so if, uh, on the one end it was that and on the other hand was interoperability. Um, and if we look at it from a tech perspective, uh, talking a bit more technical, the solution that we've um, developed from an APSA perspective, Hyperledger Indy, that's where it runs on. And we've actually uh, pulled out the um, communication interoperability component into Hyperledger Aries. Um, and that's what gave us the success in connecting two total bespoke um, solutions together without the developers actually talking to each other and utilizing the standards put in play. Um, so yes, that was to us a good achievement. And I think we need to now build on that which we will be doing um, with Standard Bank in the next couple of months. The other part is schemes, setting up schemes. This is what identity scheme looks like. This is what a mobile verification scheme looks like. This is what a medical aid type scheme looks like. This is what a SASA scheme looks like. So setting up those scheme standards so that everybody then starts uh, being able to communicate, start getting the interoperability. You get the fintechs, will start getting more involved. Um, where today, if we have a look at the solutions, they are very bespoke. They don't talk to each other. They don't understand each other because those components weren't there. That's awesome, Sean. Um, Chiso, if I can just... Uh... Sean's talked there about all these different components and, and schemes that can come out of this. How do you see um, us ensuring good governance and regulation in this space? Will it be driven through use cases and schemes? So, yeah, so the use cases will almost serve as um, the opportunity to test further because I mean we can discuss it intellectually and we can all have our own hypothesis around some of the benefits that are all well touted things like financial inclusion um, you know it enables reg tech and sub tech around AML and CFT etc right so hypothetically I think there's a united understanding around the benefits and obviously also some of the risks like cyber security data privacy misuse and is it really frictionless and is there interoperability at the end of the day so Conceptually, we understand that, but we want to go further and actually test real solutions. Um, so use cases provide a little bit more of a tangible um, proof point that almost then enables us to be very specific around um, what kinds of regulations um, to put together, right? So the use cases almost serve as that fact base that we'd need, but ultimately in terms of the output or the outcome, that's to establish a framework that um, takes into account the myriad of perspectives and issues um, around this topic and in order to set a standard and ultimately enable the positive aspects of digital ID to, um, to come to, to life while obviously mitigating some of the risks. So that's the ultimate objective, but the use cases do serve as a, as an, uh, serve a purpose of just giving us that fact base, that specificity, that detail. Um, that we then would use to support um, the crafting of um, regulatory frameworks. Great. Thanks, Kafisa. Just a, a note, um, the, the platform is experiencing a little bit of a problem around the questions. If we fix that, um, uh, we'll be able to answer your questions. I just can't see them at the moment. But um, 
we've got good momentum yet, so we'll keep going. Um, so I think the, 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 this, this leads to an interesting thing of, of how do we ensure now that coll co collaboration happens? You know, it's, I, I know so many organizations even have it as part of their values, collaboration, and we talk about it so much, but it ends up happening so little because our needs as individual organizations come into play, um, commercial aspects come into play, there's companies that exist um, solely um, because of this. So, how do you get into a world where we actually collaborate across the industry? And what does that actually look like? And, and Barry, maybe we can kick off with you. Yeah, so, so you know, ordinarily uh, commercial, commercial uh, reasons should push towards collaboration, but often it doesn't. Um, and yeah. if, we, if we look at, at what institutions are, are spending and, and what, and what the, the potential to, to reduce their costs of compliance, um, just in in that in, the, in that in that space, there's there's so much uh, gravity to to uh, pulling people together to collaborate as opposed to pulling them apart. So from some of the research we've done, it's it's in excess of sixty percent of the compliance cost is wasted on lower to low um, uh, risk individuals, and so th they're spending an inordinate amount of time doing a, a, a lot of activity that is 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 almost worthless, um, as opposed to consolidating that at, at, a, at, a, at a central level, um, like for instance with, with, with the BVN. The BVN in Nigeria, you, um, you got access to, to a whole lot of identifiers um, and that's held centrally uh, in, in, the, in the payments authority. And that, that works exceedingly well for those that are on the BVN, uh, BVN platform. Um, so the, those kinds of, 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 of forces, I think, should, should, should push to, to collaboration, but also it takes, it takes a kind of leadership. And, and we've seen that with, uh, in Australia, with the, the, the Reserve Bank in Australia um, doing it. We've seen it in, in, in other countries where it is often um, a, uh, a, a pan-industry pan or a, a, a governmental uh, factor that, 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 can, that can push to, towards, towards that. Um, yeah, so, so it's... It's often not con uh, commercial considerations, but on, on their own. It needs a blueprint. Uh, I think co collaboration just doesn't happen um, in, 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 on, of its own. It, it happens only in exceptional circumstances to a blueprint. Exactly. Kathy, how, how do you see this from your perspective? I mean, you were talking earlier about each government department almost looking at their own needs. It, if you compound that across the country and the entire industry, how do we get everyone working together on this? So, I mean, collaboration and cooperative governance are, are very nice words, but they're actually very difficult to put in place. And I'm going to start off with one little point of the payments industry. If we could get, you know, interoperability across payments, we might be able to reduce the cost and bring it down quite significantly. We're not going to get that right anytime soon. So it is a challenge. And I think probably the easiest way is to start thinking about how you can benefit from the information sharing and how you can benefit from the economies of scale and the skills that exist in other institutions. So one of the things that the COVID crisis did for us when we were rolling out the SASA grant is we had to look at how we would stitch together all the back-end databases. SASA system is as old as Noah's Ark. I mean, it's really old. It's a legacy system. Um, it really is very slow, very monolithic um, system. So what we did is we actually leveraged the various databases that existed in the public sector from UIF to Home Affairs to NSFAST to Comfund to Persol to Persol, et cetera. And we actually got the skills and capability to actually mine that data at SAR. So in that regard, um, we were able to really stitch together the database and get government to work together. But let me tell you, it was not an easy task. So just trying to even get the databases to be released, to be analyzed is, is a huge nightmare. Um, but the reality is if you can leverage that skill, um, and particularly if you think of how it's done in the payment sector across banks, I mean, the way I see it is if I am registered with APSA, for example, on Sean's platform and I am, you know, doing my, uh, you know, I've got self-attestation and I've gone up another level or two, um, is that information shared with other banking institutions? So instead of 
at, you know, Standard Bank or FNB that I might be banking with doing exactly the same thing. If you can actually share their information across platforms or you can look at beneficial ownership information for a particular company, if that information sits in one place, it's the point that Barry is making, right? There's huge benefits in actually sharing that information if it's been attested, verified by one particular institution, why go and reinvent the wheel? So I think that fundamentally is going to push institutions to start sharing information more and more. Um, you know, the information sharing story and working together is, is like a long, I mean, I started in the public sector working at Treasury in 2004 and five, and we were talking about stitched together databases. And we're now sitting in 2020, thanks to a crisis, and they say you should never waste a good crisis mm -hmm. to actually try and stitch together the data. So it's taken us like 16 or 17 years to do something that is really a no brainer. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Kahisa? Let's give this challenge to you. Give us the golden thread. <laughs> no, sure. So um, collaboration from our perspective, I mean, we obviously view it as very important. And I mean, as the basis upon which we set up the Intergovernmental FinTech Working Group, which is essentially a collaboration of multiple regulators interacting with um, the financial services sector um, in order to collaborate and surface firstly the emerging trends and secondly, look to identify proactive approaches um, to um, address some of these trends, right? So um, the basis upon which we established that and the FinTech Innovation Hub was also, again, to um, essentially ensure that we're more collaborative with industry. Yeah. Um, we create opportunities um, for um, financial services innovators to bring solutions to us and engage on that basis. And, um, and we found that it's very beneficial, it has been very beneficial for us as well, because what it's done is it's kept our fingers on the pulse just in terms of what's happening out there. And it's allowed us then to be a lot more proactive in developing regulations um, that obviously um, manage risks, but also enable some of the benefits um, that are coming out of innovation. So for us, it's an extremely crucial value and um, it's actually been beneficial um, and it's allowed us to be a lot more fast moving and proactive in how we regulate. And I mean, that's obviously in recognition of the fact that given the pace of technological change and innovation that's taking place, um, it's very easy to get left behind if you're not collaborating yeah. and partnering in some way. And obviously from a commercial perspective, I mean, some of the best case, some of the successful stories um, often have been um, off the back of partnerships, strategic partnerships, perhaps where, for instance, in FinTech, what we're seeing is you'll have a FinTech innovator um, that's developed, built out a solution, but maybe they partner with a telco that has distribution. Um, and through that um, type of partnership where um, their telco gets access to a very disruptive um, solution, but they obviously, you know, through their customer relationships, to, in coming together, they're able to scale a, a, a particular offering. So we're seeing a lot of those types of partnerships, but also you may be seeing um, other commercial partnerships, you know, that necessarily are partners of equal. They, there's both similar capabilities, but together um, they can achieve more from a scale perspective than if going at it alone. So, um, so partnerships also as a business model, I mean, that's also something commercially that we're seeing as being very um, beneficial and particularly in this um, digital era. Right. Um, Sean, um, I'm sure you've got um, some feedback around some of the things Kathy brought up and but also just to expand on, on how you see um, collaboration. You guys are doing some good work between APSA and Standard Bank. How, how are you seeing this pan out? Uh, some good news for for Kathy um, <laughs> on the, uh, uh, the uh, whole reason for us going down this whole self sovereign um, route is the actual reuse of the identity. Um, so and us actually testing the interoperability components as well is where if you are, have an APSA digital store digital wallet you could actually reuse those credentials at a, from, at a standard bank component. So 
included in the actual uh, communication is the trust level. Then from a standard bank perspective, for example, they can decide based on their risk appetite, whether they accept level two trust or they will only accept level three trust. So, um, and from a self-sovereign perspective, embedded in the actual um, ecosystem is the concept of consent. So every time you actually share your credentials, whether it's with another financial institution, whether it's with an MNO, as part of that process is actual consent. And that consent is what is um, also, if we look at the new poppy uh, components and that type of stuff, it's all embedded now, all within the same ecosystem. You can then do revocations within the ecosystem. So I've given consent for you using this data, later stage it can be revoked. Um, yeah. And the ecosystem knows about it. If I open a bank account at Standard Bank, and it is part of the ecosystem. I've got uh, it issued within my wallet. My account is closed at Standard Bank. Standard Bank does a revocation in the ecosystem. So whoever you've shared that with now knows that oh, I had a debit order. I can't do the debit order because that account has been closed. So it mm -hmm. kind of assists in that uh, flow of information as well. Oh, awesome, Sean. Um, Barry, would you like to come in a little bit around the data access? Yeah, so um, data access is, is one, one of the key enablers um, to, to any, any kind of uh, digital identity uh, system or process. Um, what we've noticed, is, say for instance, like in, in Nigeria, I think we counted it was nine or ten different um, uh, databases, biometric and, and, other, and other biographic databases that were sealed um, in, in silos between the different government departments and different different initiatives, um, but what we, we when we worked with 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 Afia across across the developing world, we, we just polled them to see what what is what really works in terms of getting access to data. And the top one that, that works without fail is a presidential decree. Then we had uh, cabinet cabinet resolutions, and then M MOUs between between the, the different the different departments, and and also um, it it also has to happen not in a vacuum. You need to have a a, 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 da a data a data framework, privacy framework, uh, privacy by design principles, uh, levels of, of assurance of data protection. So those those are all aspects in in which to house that data um, that there's trust that, that that the data won't won't be won't be uh, uh, abused, but uh, at the at the government level, it's there's definitely a, a lot a lot more that, that that can be done from the drastic decree down to just MOUs. Awesome, thanks. Um, Kathy, you had a question for Sean. Just a follow-on question: um, the the APSA wallet that he was referring to. To what extent is the vision to include additional information? So, for example, my health information or my education certificates or my visa. Um, visas and, and, and travel permits, uh, etc., in that particular wallet? Uh, all of the above. Um, so, <laughs> as, as the ecosystem grows, um, the use within the uh, ecosystem will also grow. So, our first set of use cases, of course, is because we are within the financial world will be financially linked. We have um, had conversations in the health space to start adding uh, the medical cards and all of that type of stuff um, into the ecosystem. And then from there onwards, as people build, uh, I think the use cases in themselves will just expand as people have trust in the um, ecosystem. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, I can't wait for that point in life where I can, as a consumer, use that. Um, guys, we've got five minutes left. If I could ask each one of you um, to just take a minute just to wrap up around how um, any final words on the subject, thinking about it from a perspective of a consumer and a future user of of um this kind of digital identity um 
Barry, if we can start with you again. I'm um, seeing we've got this little rhythm going, yeah? Uh, just, just quickly. Final uh, words. Uh, um, just for, from from the the, um, the working group that I sit on digitization and the, the um, task force for remittances of the UN, um, there's there's this there's no appetite to do a, an interim step or something that's interim. This is something that's going to be permanent. That coming out of COVID, this is the new world. Um, digital identity yeah. proofing uh, is is what how, how financial services will operate is operating, um, and and I think we just need to to really sort of catch up to that reality. Great. Yeah, I agree, Barry. Very true. Um, Kathy? So I think for me, you know, I'd like to move more towards uh, an interoperable sort of payment stack like India, where, you know, you have a secure digital identity sort of backbone for an economy linked to a single bank account and preferably mobile number. We know that that's very difficult in South Africa because we see a lot of communal mobile numbers between family members. And ideally, that will allow you to push services to government citizens, enable e-government services, and fundamentally embed that entire payment system within the national payments network really allows you to monetize cashless societies and really allow people to get money in the areas where they live. So I think that for me is the biggest vision in all of this. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Kahisu, final words from you. Um, sure. So Martin, from our perspective, I mean, we, we find the, um, the benefits around digital ID as it pertains to payments to be quite compelling, right? So just in terms of bringing the population to the financial system, um, what it enables from an AML CFT point of view, and also just even the increased convenience that um, comes with um, the transition to digital ID. So um, for us, those are all compelling, but obviously we wanna um, start looking at how does that actually translate into reality. So from that perspective, that's something we're really open um, to interacting with innovators on. So interrogating use cases so that we can ultimately formulate um, enabling regulatory frameworks. So this is an exciting space for us and we're looking forward to testing any solution. So if there are innovators out there, they should definitely reach out to us and look to test their solutions within our sandbox so that we can come to a we can come to a policy, enabling policy um, framework outcome. Thanks. So final words from you, Sean? Um, so from me, um, I, I think we've, uh, as, as we've discussed over the last hour, we, we've got more than enough use cases um, for us to actually prove a point. It's now collaboration. How do we now get these parties together Who's going to drive that? Um, and the technology is not a problem. The use cases are not a problem. It sounds as if from a regulatory perspective, there's more than enough willingness. It's now just getting the people in a room and doing the work. Thanks, Sean. I, I agree. So our time has come to an end. Um, I think we could have carried on for two hours. Um, I think uh, it's been so first of all thanks to the panel and, and making yourselves available I think this was awesome I, I'd like us to actually get together even outside this and, and, and have a discussion I think there's a lot to be done and and there's a bright future around how we put this together so thank you very much for participating and I hope for the audience out there that you've really enjoyed the session and that you've got benefit out of it I'm going to hand back to um, Sudeshri now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Martin, and thank you to our panel for your insightful perspective. That was definitely an informative session, and we do hope that our attendees have enjoyed it. Please do continue the session by networking uh, with each other. Uh, like Martin said, he'd like to continue the conversation, so please do reach out to each other. Thank you all once again, and have a good day.